Hi, hello, hello, welcome back. My name is Crystal and I love horror movies. If you're looking for a fun, spooky, chill setting, I'm your girl. So on this channel, I do deep dives into whatever TV show or films or film that we're talking about. There are timestamps on the bottom. So if you want to skip around a little bit, don't worry, I'm not going to be offended. And of course, once you finish this video, be sure to do all the fun stuff like comment, subscribe, follow, share, you know if you want to. Okay, so if you clicked on this video, you probably sneaked a peek on how long this video is. I am 100% sitting here with my favorite blanket, which is my ghost face blanket. I don't wanna cover my face because it will probably ruin my focus. My ghost face blanket and my favorite drink, which is Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Um, cherry flavored, it's my favorite. And I encourage you to do the same because this video is meant to be watched from minute zero to whatever minute you can see and editing crystal can see. I know that I said, feel free to skip around, but I just feel like it's important to watch this video from beginning to end, but you know, free will do whatever you want. <laughs> so as you can tell from the title, we are going to be covering the 2013 film, The Conjuring. We follow paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who work to help a family terrorized by dark presence in the farmhouse. The film was directed by James Wan, and it was written by Chad and Carrie Hayes, and it stars Patrick Wilson and Vera Formiga. Juan, who we all know from this universe, as well as the Saw universe and the Insidious universe. So in the next coming weeks, months, possibly a year, depending on how long this video is and how long it's gonna take me to get through them. I'm also going to be covering The Conjuring 2, The Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It, Annabelle, Creation, Annabelle, Annabelle Comes Home, La Lorena, the Nun and The Nun too. so stay tuned. So before we get into the deep dive of the video, I wanted to provide you with how to watch all of The Conjuring movies in order. And you might be wondering, Crystal, why aren't you doing them in order? Well, the answer is I really like the 2013 Conjuring film and wanted to start with this one, so. So the first film in chronological order is The Nun that takes place in 1952 in Romania. As a Roman Catholic church and a nun are uncovering an unholy secret involving the evil nun. Then we have Annabelle Creation that takes place in 1955 in California. And it's the story of a doll maker who opens his home to six orphans and a nun only to have an ancient evil released in his own home. Then we have The Nun 2, which appears in 1956, which is four years after Sister Irene's first encounter with Volok. Then we have Annabelle, which takes place in 1967 in Southern California, 12 years after the official origin of the doll. Annabelle tells the story of a young doctor and his wife who bring the doll into their home only for it to have made it their life a living hell. Then we have The Conjuring, which takes place in 1971 on Rhode Island. Then we have Annabelle Comes Home, taking place only one year later in the story in 1972. The Warren's young daughter Judy must contend with Annabelle and other demons who escape the Warren's artifact room while the couple is away. Then we have La Lorena, which is a spin-off that follows a mother in 1973 Los Angeles who must save her children from a malevolent spirit trying to steal them. So the curse of La Lorena is the most detached and removed from the franchise ongoing story, only featuring Father Perez from Annabelle as a connecting character. Then we have The Conjuring 2, which takes place in 1977 and brings back Lorraine and Ed Warren, now notorious from the Amityville case, as they help a family being haunted by a malevolent spirit. Then we have The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, which takes place in the 80s based on the real trial of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, who claimed demonic possession after murdering his landlord. Lorraine and Ed Warren are drawn into the case after they apparently exercise a demon out of a young boy's body. So as for the future for The Conjuring universe, well, The Conjuring 4 is already in the works, but this film could possibly be the last. A TV series set in The Conjuring universe has also been greenlit for Max. So what's interesting about this film is that it contains no sex, 
no nudity, little profanity, tame and mostly bloodless violence, and brief descriptions of alcohol and no smoking. Yet it received an R rating. This was solely for the scare factor alone. And I remember the first time that I saw The Conjuring. I was just spooked for days, <laughs> maybe even weeks. So let's get into it, shall we? So the film starts and our eardrums are blasted with very scary, loud, foreboding music. Then and we meet Ed and Lorraine Warren, the Annabelle doll, and the current owners of the evil doll. And we can see that it's the year 1968. So the people that own the Annabelle doll tell Ed and Lorraine Warren that they contacted a medium and she told them that a seven-year-old girl named Annabelle Higgins had died in their apartment. And apparently this Annabelle took a liking to the doll and the owners felt sorry for Annabelle. So they gave her permission to move into the doll. And once they did this, things took a very sinister turn. The owners of the doll got home one night to see a note on the ground that said, miss me, and that Annabelle was sitting in the hallway when they had left her in the spare room. They see that Annabelle is holding onto several red crayons and that a bedroom was destroyed with red marks all over the walls and pictures of them were smashed and scattered. They then decide it's best to throw Annabelle into the dumpster, but then later that night are awoken by loud pounding on their front door, but no one was there just the crumpled up note that said, miss me. They then hear pounding from a door inside their apartment and the scene cuts back to the present. Ed explains that there is no such thing as this little girl, Annabelle, and there never was. To which Lorraine explains that ghosts don't have that kind of power and that whatever is inhabiting Annabelle is evil and inhumane and it tricked them into thinking it was harmless. The group essentially gave this evil entity permission to infest their lives and is using the doll as a conduit. Then the scene shifts and we see that Ed and Lorraine are speaking to a group of college students at a seminar called Seekers of the Supernatural, and they are presenting the case of the Annabelle doll. We learn that Ed and Lorraine have their title as demonologists, and then we get this, which shows us more of a backstory. We learn that Lorraine is a gifted clairvoyant, and Ed is the only non-ordained demonologist in the Catholic Church. Then we get every horror fan's favorite, or at least favorite, line based on a true story. And we get our loud, ominous music back and the title card. So we are now in Rhode Island and it's 1971 and we are introduced to the Perrin family. Roger as the father, Caroline as the mother, and their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April. And not even two minutes this family has been here. Their sweet angel baby puppy, Sadie refuses to go inside. So we also get this really cool one take shot of the family moving in and like following them around as they're unpacking. We then get our first look at the tree and the production team actually built this 50 foot tree for the film. So while the youngest daughter April is sitting at said tree, we see that she has a music box. And as April is cranking the handle to play the music, the atmosphere gets darker and we get a breeze as April runs back inside. So later that night, we learn about a game that the girls play called hide and clap. And in playing the game, we are introduced to the cellar that at this point is boarded up until Roger pulls away some of the boards. He lights a match and makes his way down to the dark cellar to find an old piano and old furniture. And as the family is getting ready for bed, their dog Sadie is still outside barking. So with just about several minutes into the film, we can tell that this family is very close. They're very happy and they're very excited for their new beginnings at their new home. So the next morning, Caroline wakes up and she discovers that she has a bruise on her shin. And we also learn that during the night, one of the girls has said that something in her bedroom smelled like it died. Caroline then makes her way downstairs and she finds Roger in the cellar fixing the broken light bulb. And we get a better view of the things that are in the basement. Roger is also down there checking on the furnace because the house is very cold. Caroline also notices that all their clocks in the house have stopped at 3.07 AM. But before they can think about bruises or clocks, they hear a scream from outside that's coming from April because she has found Sadie, who is now dead. So our location then shifts to Connecticut to Ed and Lorraine's home. And we see that Ed is with a reporter and he is showing the reporter different artifacts throughout their artifact room. And he tells the reporter, do not touch anything. We also learn that the Warrens have a priest that comes by once a month to bless the room and that it's safer for all of these artifacts to be in this room rather than out in the real world. Ed then shows the reporter the Annabelle doll and the reporter asks how they protect themselves from 
all of these evil things in this room and the evil that's out there. The reporter then brings up something that happened to his wife, Lorraine, during an exorcism. Then the scene cuts and we meet Judy, who is Ed and Lorraine's daughter. And she is kind of like creeping through the artifacts room when Ed catches her. So after the reporter leaves, Lorraine is brushing Judy's hair in a rocking chair. Then Judy runs out of the room and we get a little bit of an insight of what happened to Lorraine during the exorcism that the reporter had brought up. And we can see that Ed blames himself for whatever happened. So we're now back with the Perrin family and we see that the grandfather clock in the hallway has once again stopped at the time 3.07 a.m. The family, of course, is asleep and then we see that Christine's foot gets pulled by something. Half awake, she blames it on her sister Nancy who shares the same bedroom as her and the smell that they were talking about from the previous night is back again. So Roger, who had fallen asleep downstairs at his desk, hears a banging and then a door opening. So in this older house, we can see that they have a door that kind of connects the living room into the kitchen and the door is like slowly creeping open but then we see that it was probably triggered probably triggered by a window that is open in the kitchen. He then hears banging coming from upstairs. And what I love about this film in general is that we get these scary scenes invading the space instead of taking them over. And what I mean by that is Roger's turning to make his way upstairs and his daughter Andrea is standing in the middle of the staircase and She's not saying anything, but then she tells him that Cindy is sleepwalking again. We then see that Cindy is banging her head on the dresser in Andrea's room. And Andrea says that she has never seen Cindy like this before. Roger then helps Cindy back to bed, but you can see that Andrea is just like a little spooked. So it's now the next morning and Roger and Caroline are talking about how Cindy has been sleepwalking again. And as Caroline is getting out of the shower, Roger sees another bruise on her shoulder. Then Roger is leaving from work and he hears something crash into the side of the house and it's a bird. We then see four out of the five girls leave for school, which leaves Caroline and their youngest daughter, April, at home. And April is doing that creepy thing where like little kids talk to things that aren't there. But of course, since this is a horror movie, there is something there. And this thing is called Rory. And in order to see Rory, you have to use the music box that April was playing with when she was sitting in the tree earlier in the film. So you turn the key, you play the music, you wait for the music to stop, and then you can see Rory in the reflection of the mirror inside of the music box. So April tells Caroline to do this. Caroline does it, but she doesn't see Rory. April then asks Caroline to play hide and clap, which we saw the girls playing earlier in the film, where the seeker wears a handkerchief or a scarf or something to cover their eyes. And they are allowed to ask for three claps in order to find whoever is hiding. Caroline then spins around 10 times and asks for the first clap and she hears it coming from Andrea's room. Now remember, Andrea's room has that really creepy old dresser that Cindy was banging her head head into the night before. And as she is making her way into Andrea's room, we see the doors of this dresser slowly start to open. Caroline asks for the third clap and we see these hands come out of the dresser that are clearly not April's and then they clap. She even says the line, I can hear you breathing. And then she hears footsteps behind her. So she quickly takes off the scarf that's covering her eyes and realizes that there is no one in the dresser and April wasn't even in the same bedroom. So it's now later in the night, we realize that Roger is a truck driver and he has taken a job to drive down to Florida and he's gonna be gone for about a week and he's leaving the next morning. The family is all asleep now and we get a repeat of what we saw earlier in the film where Christine Christine's foot gets pulled and the second pull is stronger, which fully wakes her up this time. And then she looks over and she sees that Nancy, her sister, is still asleep in her bed. So Christine slowly creeps to the end of the bed and sees that nothing is there. But then she peeks on the side of her bed and she sees that their bedroom door is slowly starting to move. She wakes up Nancy and she points to the door and she says, do you see it? There's someone behind the door. There's someone standing over there and it's looking right at us. But Nancy can't see anything. Nancy then gets up and shows her that there is nothing behind the door, but then the same rotting meat body smell is back again. Christine then tells her that this thing is standing right behind her. And as Nancy slowly turns, the door slams shut and Christine starts screaming. Roger and Caroline then rush into the room and turn on the light and we see that there is no one standing behind the door. And they are trying to calm her down, but she tells them that this thing spoke to her and it said that this thing wants her family 
dead. So after that scary as fuck scene, we are back with Ed and Lorraine Warren. And Ed is telling Lorraine that he's going to run to the store for a few things. And Lorraine kind of looks at him and she's basically basically like saying, I can tell when you're lying. He then tells his wife that Father Gordon, who is their contact at the Catholic Church, told him about a case that he wants them to look into. Lorraine then tells Ed that she's coming, even with Ed being apprehensive about what happened last time. Ed also mentions in this scene that maybe they should take a break. Lorraine then reminds him of what he said on their wedding night, and he said that God brought them together for a reason. So the Warrens are now with a couple who thinks that their house is haunted Haunted, but the Warrens explain that it's it's just old floorboards in their attic reacting to temperature change and it's also some pipes. So what I like about this part of the film is that we see that Ed and Lorraine aren't doing this work to like rip people off and they believe that there is mostly always a rational explanation for things that go bump in the night. So back with the parent family, we see that Caroline has yet another bruise and we also see that she's starting to take iron pills. She is then folding laundry and she hears clapping and she assumes that it's the girls playing the game. She goes to check and she sees that all of her daughters are sound asleep in their beds. Then we hear a huge crash behind her and it's all the family photos that were on the wall come crashing down to the ground. And we also hear a child laughing. Caroline then slowly makes her way downstairs and she starts turning on lights when she hears another clap and someone or something walking around and the door to the cellar opens. So she's walking down into the cellar and she's turning on the lights and she looks really quickly into the cellar and tells whoever is down there that she's gonna lock them in. But before she can lock the door, the door slams into her face and she falls backwards down the cellar stairs. And as she's like trying to find her bearings in the cellar, she's looking around the basement when a red ball comes bouncing towards her. She runs back up the stairs and the light bulb shatters, shrouding her in darkness. We then hear laughing again as Carolyn quickly lights a match. Then we hear someone or something say behind her, want to play hide and clap. And two hands come out of the darkness and clap. So while Carolyn is trapped in the basement, we see that Cindy is sleepwalking again and her sleepwalking wakes up Andrea. Andrea then helps Cindy back into her own bed and then she hears banging from inside of the cabinet and she slowly walks back over to the cabinet and we see Cindy sit up in bed behind her. Andrea pulls open the dresser and sees that nothing is there, but then we get the scene that scarred me for days with something crouched on top of the dresser, jumping on top of Andrea. Roger, who is just getting home, he hears the screaming from inside the house and he runs inside. He pulls open the cellar door where Carolyn has been trapped and they all run into Andrea's room and she is still screaming and rolling around on the floor. And then the scene pulls very slowly back out away from the house. So we are now at the Warrens, who are giving students at the Massachusetts Western University a little lesson on demonic possession. So Ed is explaining that demons feed on our fears, and he tells the story of Maurice, a French-Canadian farmer who had no more than a third-grade education, was able to speak perfect Latin even backwards while he was under possession. We also learn from the story that Maurice had been badly abused by his father and an evil spirit made its home in this man. So the footage of the possession that they're showing this class shows Maurice with blood streaming out of his eyes and an upside down cross protruding from under his skin. So after the footage is shown, we learn that Ed is not authorized to perform an exorcism, but he can be there to like assist. We also learn the fate of Maurice after the exorcism and he tried to murder his wife, but was unsuccessful and then turn the gun on himself. Then we learn about the three stages of demonic activity, infestation, oppression, and possession. Infestation is the first stage, which is the whispers, the footsteps, the feelings of another presence. And when the camera pans to the class, we see the real Lorraine Warren is seated right in front. Oppression is the second stage where there is one victim and it's usually someone who is psychologically vulnerable and that person is targeted specifically by an external force and it puts the victim and a weakened state, which of course leads to the third phase, which is possession. And we also see that Caroline is in attendance to this presentation as well. So after the presentation is over, Caroline approaches Ed and Lorraine, and she's pleading her case about her family and how something is terribly wrong in their home. Lorraine then speaks for both her and Ed and says that, of course, they will come take a look. So when the Warrens arrive at the parents' family home, we see that the family has been staying in the living room because they feel safer and it's also warmer because there are many parts of the house that are very cold. And we have this brief second of Lorraine looking at Caroline and 
you can see like concern all, all over Lorraine's face, but she brushes it off. But of course, Ed notices. Caroline then tells the Warrens that their house is always freezing, even with turning up the furnace, and that the activity in their home has gotten worse the past few nights. She tells Ed that there's this awful smell like rotting meat and how the smell kind of like moves around the house. Ed tells her that a rancid smell could mean some type of demonic activity. We also see that Lorraine is picking up on things as she moves throughout the house as well. Roger then tells Ed that they hear banging all throughout the night. That stops at dawn and the bangings come in three, which of course can sometimes mean it's an insult to the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Roger and Caroline then tell the Warrens about the birds flying into their house and how their clocks always stop at 3.07 a.m. And then we get a little bit of backstory on the dresser where the demon was crouched earlier. <laughs> The dresser was there when they moved in, and then Lorraine asked to be shown the basement. And we get this really cool scene that kind of reminded me a little bit of Insidious, where Lorraine has her eyes closed, and we can get an insight of how she works as a clairvoyant. And we can hear the things that she heard when she first stepped into the house, and it's a lot of screaming and a voice saying, look what she made me do. She then tells Ed that something awful happened here. So Roger, Caroline, and Ed are now sitting in the parents' family kitchen, and Ed asks Caroline about the bruises. And she tells him that it's some kind of iron deficiency. And then he asks them why they haven't moved yet, to which Roger says all their money is tied up in their house. We see Ed start to record the conversation. And he asks Caroline to explain all the things that have been happening from the house from the beginning. Meanwhile, Lorraine is talking to Alice, who is the youngest daughter, about her friend Rory and how he is always sad and Alice thinks something bad happened to him. Lorraine then starts playing the old music box and once the song ends, she sees Rory in the reflection of the mirror in the music box. Lorraine then makes her way outside and stops at the tree in the parents' backyard. Ed follows behind her and before she turns, she hears creaking and then we get the second scene that scarred me for days the feet. And we can see at this point that Lorraine is very affected by the activity that's going on in the house and on the land. And she falls back a little bit and Ed catches her. So now we have the Warrens and the parents sitting at the kitchen table. And we learn that the parents bought the house at an auction from the bank and they didn't know who lived there before them. Ed then informs them that they need an exorcism on the house. And at this point, Carolyn wants to leave, but unfortunately that's not going to help. Lorraine then explains why. And it's because she has been seeing this dark entity the minute that she walked into the house. The dark entity that is haunting their house and haunting their land. And it, it has latched itself onto Carolyn and has latched itself onto their daughters. So no matter where the family goes, the entity will continue to follow them and feed off of them. She also explains that there's a lot of entities in this place, but the one that she keeps seeing is the most hateful. Roger then asks if they should just call a priest, but Ed explains that it's not that easy and how exorcisms don't always work. They don't always save the soul, aka Maurice. He continues to explain that the church needs proof, they need evidence to even perform an exorcism. As the Warrens are leaving, they tell Roger and Caroline that they're going to have their team do some digging into the house and that whatever this thing is, is probably not going to like that the Warrens are there. So it is now later that night and the Warrens are back home and Judy, their daughter, gives Lorraine a necklace with her picture inside. Meanwhile, Ed is listening back to the recording that he did earlier at the parents and he has Lorraine listen to it back. He tells her that Carolyn's voice didn't record and he plays it back to show her proof. Lorraine then shares with Ed what she found. The original farmhouse was built in 1863 by a man named Jedson Sherman, who was married to a woman named Bathsheba. And Bathsheba is related to Mary Town Esty, who was one of the uh, women accused of witchcraft in Salem, and she was hung during the trials. So after Bathsheba marries Jedson, they had a baby, and when the baby was seven days old, Jedson caught her sacrificing the baby in front of the fireplace. Then Bathsheba ran out into the backyard, climbed up the tree, proclaimed her love to Satan, and cursed anyone who tried to take her land and then she hung herself. And her time of death was pronounced at 3.07 a.m. And then we learn about Rory. So a woman named Walker lived there in the 30s with her son Rory, who mysteriously disappeared into the woods. And then Walker killed herself in the cellar. Lorraine also discovers that the farm was originally 200 acres and has since been subdivided and sold off. And there are more occurrences of death like a boy drowning and a maid who worked in another home on the property who committed all of the people who took Bathsheba's land. And then we get the third thing that scared me for days. The recorder turned itself back on and we hear screaming and moaning and static and the clock on the Warren's 
kitchen table stops at 3.07 a.m. So then we meet a couple new characters who are there for a little bit of comic relief, thank God. Officer Brad Hamilton and Drew. And then we get a montage of Ed and the team setting up various things throughout the house to capture the evidence and the proof that the Catholic Church needs in order to carry out the exorcism. There's bells on door handles, there's cameras, there's microphones, there's thermostats, there's lights. Meanwhile, Lorraine is talking to Caroline about Bathsheba and how the baby that she had sacrificed was never really a child to her and how Bathsheba used her God-given gift as the ultimate offense against God because witches believe that it elevates their status in the eyes of Satan. We then see a little bit more of Lorraine's gift as a clairvoyant when she helps Caroline put up a picture of the parent family at the beach. Caroline tells Lorraine that this day meant so much to her because it felt like a fresh start with a new house and a new beginning and Caroline tells Lorraine how much her family means to her. So it's now later in the evening and everyone is getting ready to start getting that evidence. Ed takes out a small kit with holy water and we can see in this kit there's also some crosses and crucifixes and he starts placing them like around the living room and in different parts of the house while telling Roger that religious objects will get a reaction from anything unholy. So before he is even done setting up all of these religious things, they hear a bell jingling and the cellar door slowly starts to open and the camera flashes. We then get footage of Ed, Lorraine, and Brad going into the cellar and Brad is filming. Ed then asks the entity to give them some kind of sign and Lorraine is being affected by something but then she tells them that it's gone. So as they make their way upstairs, Ed hears a thump but then it's nothing. He comes back up and he is telling the group that sometimes it just doesn't work the way you want it to and as he is saying this, the basement door slams shut. We then get some of the comic relief that I was talking about with Officer Brad and Drew when Drew is teasing Officer Brad about being scared of the door slamming on its own. The clock then strikes 3.08 and not much has really happened except for the the cellar door slamming. It's now the next morning and the Warrens and the parents, Drew and Officer Brad, are having pancakes for breakfast and everybody just seems to be in high spirits and Roger tells the group that he's going to take the girls to get some ice cream and Carolyn says that she's going to stay behind so that she can take a nap because she's very tired from the late nights. Ed and Lorraine then tell Caroline to go rest and they'll kind of look over things throughout the house while she is resting. So Ed and Lorraine are now outside and Lorraine is taking some sheets off the laundry line and they have a nice little moment here between husband and wife. Ed then leaves Lorraine to finish up the laundry and then we see the wind start to pick up and a storm is rolling in. We then get another one of those chilling scenes as one of the sheets gets caught in the wind and the sheet is taking the outline of something very big and very tall. The sheet then slams into an upstairs window and it's Bathsheba aka the thing that was crouched on top of the dresser from earlier. We then see handprints form on a sleeping Caroline's arm and she screams and she sits up in bed while Bathsheba floats above her and she spits some like real nasty red goo into her mouth. So Lorraine is now racing upstairs to Caroline who is in the bathroom who is coughing and gagging at this point and Lorraine is pounding on the door and then it opens and Caroline comes out and she's like looking a little meh. And she tells Lorraine that she is fine and that she hears Roger and the girls getting home. So we then get a little heart to heart between Roger and Ed. While Ed is working on the family's broken down Chevy, Roger thanks Ed for coming to help his family. To which Ed says it's all Lorraine and how he didn't really want to come. <laughs> he tells Roger that whatever Lorraine sees, touches, or feels, it helps people, but it takes a toll on her. It takes little pieces of her bit by bit. We then learn about what was being alluded to us throughout the entire film. Ed tells Roger that a few months ago they were working on a case and Lorraine saw something and we see that the case that Ed is talking about is the Maurice possession. And we get a flashback of a possessed Maurice lunging at Lorraine and like staring into her eyes before she screams. And after they got home, Lorraine locked herself in their bedroom and she didn't talk and she didn't eat for eight days. It's now later that night and the crew is back at it again trying to get the footage and the proof to send to the church and officer brad goes to make himself some coffee and he hears something on the porch and we see that the rocking chair that is on the porch is like steadily rocking back and forth and a whisper of look what she made me do officer brad goes outside to scope it out but he doesn't see anything he then comes back inside and out of the corner of his eye he sees the ghost of the maid with the slit wrist that lorraine had mentioned earlier in the film officer brad decides it's a good idea to follow the ghost and then he turns back but then the ghost runs into his face screaming, look what she made me do. Officer Brad screams for Ed and tells him what happened. And then we see camera lights start flashing and it's Cindy who is sleepwalking. Ed then tells the group that someone is with Cindy and Cindy isn't the one who's triggering the cameras. Cindy then disappears into a bedroom and the door slams. 
Ed and Roger race up the stairs to try to get the door open, and Drew runs to their setup and tells the others that someone is in the room with Cindy, and we can tell from the voice that it's Rory. We can hear through the headphones that Rory is telling Sydney a place where he hides. And the bedroom that they're in is Andrea's with the creepy-ass wardrobe, and Cindy is missing. Ed tells Officer Brad to go get a UV light. It's also very, very cold in this bedroom. And Ed is able to use the UV light to find a hidden trap door in the back of the wardrobe. And inside is Cindy in a crawl space. Then April, the youngest daughter, tells Lorraine that that is where Rory hides when he's afraid. Lorraine then decides to crawl into the makeshift hiding place with a flashlight. And she sees old toys. And there's a space on the shelf to which the music box, the youngest daughter, Alice, has been carrying around. It perfectly fits into that space. Lorraine then sees a rope caught in the floorboards and pulls it up to discover it's a noose. She goes in turn to show Ed, but the floorboards breaks under her foot and she falls all the way down to the cellar. Meanwhile, Ed runs through the house trying to find her. Lorraine then hears crying and she shines the flashlight in the direction of the noise. But before she can see anything, she hears the music box go off next to her. She cranks the handle to play the music and then we hear the crying again with, she made me do it. And we see the figure of Walker and Rory. Rory clearly dead in her lap while Walker is holding a bloody knife. And we get this really cool scene of Lorraine holding the flashlight up into the entity's face while she is looking in the mirror of the music box. And Walker's entity is slowly turning to face her, but then she disappears. Lorraine then looks forward again, and Walker is right in front of her saying, she made me do it. We then hear creaking like a rope. And this scene, this is the scene that absolutely terrified me is the swinging feet of Bathsheba, and then they slowly start to turn to face Lorraine. Like, are you kidding me? That scene was so scary. <laughs> so as Lorraine goes to run back upstairs, she is held back by the necklace that her daughter Judy gave her, and it gets torn off and is stuck on one of the pieces of wood in the basement. And then she runs up the stairs and tells Ed she knows what Bathsheba does. She possesses the mother to kill the child. And she visits Caroline every night, and that is where the bruises are coming from. And she is feeding off Caroline. So remember those crucifixes that Ed put up? Well, the dark entity don't like it. And it starts knocking them over right onto the ground. And then we see the entity grab Nancy's hair and start dragging her across the floor. Lorraine thinks quickly and cuts off Nancy's hair, releasing her. So it's now the next morning and we see that the Perrin family is loading up their car to drive to a hotel. And Ed is explaining to Roger that he's going to send the footage they've captured to the church. And when they get approval for the exorcism, he will be back. So while Lorraine is waiting to leave, she hears the voice of Judy calling for her. She follows her daughter's voice to the dock and she sees a ghostly figure of Judy floating in the water. She then runs into the house to call her mother who's watching over Judy and tells her to check on Judy who is fine. She then tells Ed what she saw and she also tells him that she knows that it's some kind of warning. The parent family then arrive at the hotel and you can tell like something is off with Caroline because obviously she is possessed. So Ed and Lorraine are now showing Father Gordon the footage they've captured and Father Gordon tells them that it might be difficult because the parent family children are not baptized and the family does not attend church and the approval for the exorcism will have to come directly from the Vatican. And we then see the pictures that were captured when Cindy was sleepwalking and we can see that Rory was captured right behind her guiding her up the stairs. Father Gordon then promises the Warrens that he will push the request through himself. It's later that night and Judy is sleeping in her bedroom and we see that she hangs her locket on the nightstand and the locket is spinning. We then get a flash of Lorraine's locket that is still in the cellar of the Perrin family's home. Judy is then woken up by something pulling her foot. She wakes up startled and she is calling for her parents. She then goes downstairs and we see that the door to the haunted artifacts room is open and Annabelle the doll from the beginning of the film is missing. A light then flickers off and a black cloud comes towards Judy and she runs and shuts herself into a room. We then hear very loud pounding on the door and then it stops. The light in the room then goes off and the rocking chair in the room is rocking back and forth and we see that Bathsheba is in the chair combing Annabelle's hair. The Warrens get home and they hear Judy screaming and just as Ed is about to break down the door the rocking chair turns to face Judy and then smashes into the wall right where she was just standing. Ed then goes to check on Annabelle and sees that she is still in the case, locked away. So as Roger and Drew arrive back to the hotel where the parent family is staying, the girls run out and tell them that their mother, Caroline, took Christine in April and drove away. The girls also tell Roger 
that their mother smelled like rotting meat and that they don't know where they went. Roger then quickly calls the Warrens and tells them all this and Lorraine says they went back to the house because as you can remember, Bathsheba possesses the mother to kill the child. So Ed doesn't want Lorraine coming with him, but she tells him the only way to protect Judy is if they stop all this where it started. Otherwise, the entity is going to latch onto them again. Lorraine then tells Ed that he's not going to lose her and that they need to finish this together. So then we get a fancy police escort from Officer Brown and the Warrens arrive back at the parent family home. The door is of course locked, but Officer Brad blows that sucker apart with a gun and it blows open. What I like about this scene a lot is that when the door is being blown back, we get this real like ominous choir singing accompanied with Caroline screaming from the basement. So Roger and Drew are trying to hold Caroline back from killing Christine with a pair of scissors. And Ed, Roger, and Officer Brad are dragging Caroline upstairs to get to the priest for an exorcism. And just as they're about to take her out, burns and bruises start appearing all over her body. And Lorraine explains that if they take her out of the house, the witch will kill her. Caroline is then dragged back down into the basement, and she is just getting manhandled by this witch. Drew then puts Christine in the car and runs back inside to find April, who ran away when they were dragging Caroline up the stairs. So in the cellar, there's just a lot of tomfoolery happening. Caroline is strangling Ed. Officer Brad is trying to help. Caroline bites a chunk of his cheek off. Lorraine then grabs a sheet and throws it on top of Caroline, and they get her into an old chair and are able to tie her and handcuff her to the chair. And Ed insists that they call Father Gordon, but Lorraine is pretty much like, there's no way, he is too far away. Ed then tells them they need to do an exorcism himself, and he tries to get Lorraine to leave, but she is like, no way, God brought us together for a reason. Meanwhile, Drew is still looking for April. Ed then starts the exorcism with Lorraine next to him and Roger and Officer Brad behind them. Ed then throws holy water on Caroline, and the whole ground starts shaking. Upstairs, Drew hears banging and it's birds circling the house and slamming into the windows and he hears April crying from under the floorboards. As Ed continues the exorcism, he yells for Roger and Lorraine to hold Caroline down. Lorraine then yells for Caroline not to give in and Ed tells the entity to reveal itself and we get blood spattering from beneath the sheet and the face of the witch is revealed. But then everything goes still, and the chair slowly starts to lift off the ground and turn upside down, slamming into the floorboards above. Ed yells to put her down, and she slams into the floor, and then a cabinet almost falls on top of Ed. We then get this very eerie laughing from Caroline telling Roger that Caroline is already gone and they're all going to die. Drew is able to find April, and she is in the floorboards under the kitchen. The witch hearing this grabs the scissors and runs under the house to find April, and she's able to make her way to April, and just as she is about to kill April, Ed screams out the witch's name. Lorraine, who has made her way upstairs, places her hand on top of Caroline's head and is telling her to fight, while Ed is telling Roger that they need to get Caroline to fight from the inside. Lorraine then tells Caroline to remember the day at the beach and how much her family means to her. Caroline then starts gagging and throwing up the demonic entity and looks around unsure of how she got there and she hears April say, Mommy. So it is now the next morning and Roger is helping Caroline out of the house and we can see the bruises are disappearing from her body. April then goes up to Lorraine and gives her back her necklace that was stuck in the cellar. And then we get some very nice happy music as the camera pans out from the family's home. The Warrens then arrive home and Lorraine tells Ed that she's going to call Father Gordon and tell him what happened while Ed places the music box in the their artifacts room. We also learned from Lorraine that the Vatican approved the exorcism. And we also learned that Father Gordon wanted to know if the Warrens were available the next day so he could talk to them about a case in Long Island. As Ed shuts the door to the room, we hear the music box playing and the camera zooms in very slowly into the mirror and the film ends. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Okay, so nine hours later, guys, let's just spend the rest of the time talking about Patrick Wilson, okay? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, guys, a uh, little bit of an outfit change. I was sweating in that sweatshirt. Um, things might look a little bit different because I had to like, whatever, you guys don't care. But yeah, let's get into. <laughs> don't worry, though, I still have my uh, blanket on here. So there is a reason that The Conjuring has gone down in horror history as a favorite. The acting, the setting, the pacing, 
the scares. And while I was making these notes, the scenes that I mentioned that scared me, they still scare me. I was still cringing even when I knew that when those particular scenes were coming. Every single thing that happens builds tension and it's deliberate. And just what's so good about this film is that we are not spoon-fed the information and even though this film is long, there is not one scene that like slows it down or just feels out of place. This is why this video is so much longer than my others because every line, every move, every glance is just so important to the story. Another thing I want to note is the music that we hear throughout the film. It was this classic foreboding music, but it didn't overtake the entire scene. And we have to talk about James Wan's camera work. The way that he worked with like the one shots and the slow zooms, he also gave us different POVs, whether like we were the dark entity that was watching the family. And at one point we're even like over the shoulder of the characters. Like it's just, it was, it's so good. And having the film like set in the 70s just made it more authentic to the viewers. And Juan was able to match the atmosphere of what life was like back then. And it had this really retro feel and it transported us back, especially the scene where Officer Brad is recording Ed and Lorraine as they go down into the cellar. And The Conjuring takes elements that are very familiar to us when it comes to horror movies, like the strange smells, the creaking doors, and of course, a very dark, very old, very creepy cellar. We've seen these tricks before, but something about this film just makes them so much scarier, and it feels more real. We also got the story of Annabelle in the beginning of the film that sets us up for the scares that we are going to see later in the film. And this element of sort of like intertwining the parents with, with the life of the Warrens was really interesting too because we saw both sides of the story and we also saw how that this evil entity can inhabit different places. I think horror fans, especially like paranormal subgenre horror fans are just fascinated by the life and the work and the career of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And you know, to have Patrick Wilson and Vera just embody them and they just do it so well that it makes the film so much more intriguing. Like, I wanted more of these characters the first time that I watched The Conjuring. I also really liked how Patrick Wilson played Ed. We could tell that he really cared about his family and his wife, like, before his career. I feel like a lot of the times when we're introduced to, like, groups of paranormal investigators, they're always out to, like, get the best shots. And they don't really think too much of the well-being of others. But Ed Warren did. He didn't want his wife to be near the exorcism after what happened with Maurice. I've also heard some horror fans are not a big fan of the ending, but I really liked it. It gave us the totality of all of the things that were happening throughout the film, and I think it just did an amazing job. And it was just so scary. <laughs> so how close is this film to the actual events that happened to the Perrin family? So director James Wan was adamant to keep what happened as close to the story as possible. And Patrick and Vera also spent time with Ed and Lorraine, which definitely helped them, I'm sure, capture the spirit of the two. And Andrea, the eldest daughter of the Perrin family, published a three-part memoir titled House of Darkness, House of Light. And she recalled the smell of rotting flesh a disturbing presence in the cellar, and their beds hovering off of the ground. So now let's talk about Bathsheba Sherman. Born Bathsheba Thayer in Rhode Island in 1812, she married Judson Sherman, and Bathsheba took care of the house while Judson took care of the farm and the land. The couple went on to possibly have three children, but they all died before the age of seven. And the reason I say possibly is because there's no census report that could be found to confirm the children. But while I was digging through, records show that she she had a son whose name was Herbert who went on to live a full life. So how did this housewife get the reputation of a witch? There is no real evidence for her being a witch, only legend and local folklore. It is believed that while in the care of Bathsheba, an infant died and the cause of death was caused by a large sewing needle impaled to the base of the child's skull. Though the townspeople believe that Bathsheba sacrificed the infant as an offering to the devil, due to insufficient evidence, a court found that she was innocent of any wrongdoing. So despite her name being cleared legally, the public was not convinced. So 
How did Bathsheba die? There are different speculations on what happened when she died. Some believe that her body turned to stone, and some believe that she died from a bizarre form of paralysis that puzzled and scared doctors. So how did the Perrin family connect Bathsheba to what was happening in their home? Carolyn told Anna Lorraine that she had been laying on a couch when she felt a piercing pain in her calf, and when she went to go inspect it, there was a pool of blood coming from her calf. So how does this connect to Bathsheba? Well, Andrea described this incident in her book, and she described the wound on her mother's leg as a perfectly concentric circle, as if a large sewing needle had impaled her skin. So remember in the movie, we learned that there were other deaths that happened in the 200 acre farmland, the maid and the mother and her son. Well, according to Andrea, eight generations of one extended family lived and died in that house prior to to their arrival, and some of them never left. So according to records, there was two suicides by hanging, one suicide by poison, the rape and murder of 11-year-old Prudus Arnold by a farmhand, two drownings, and the passing of four men who froze to death, in addition to other tragic losses of life. So what is going on with the Perrin family home now? Well, thanks to the internet, with platforms like TikTok and this one, we get an inside scoop of what's going on in the day-to-day -day life of the owners. The owners have nightly paranormal investigations. They offer day tours and there are also live streamed events. There are also a ton of YouTube videos where content creators are spending a night in the home trying to contact the dark entities that might still be there. Overall, The Conjuring is one of my favorite horror films and it is also one of the scariest horror films I've seen in the last 10 years. Alright guys, that's going to be it for me and to this video. Thank you so so much if you watched this entire video. I really really appreciate you. Be sure to do all that fun stuff like like subscribe comment below share you can follow me on my social media too if you want to and i'll see you guys in my next video bye